Um, actually, the topic should probably be called multivariate time series analysis. Uh, now, I've already um, discussed the, uh, at several points some of the some of our own studies um, about this uh, about this topic, and we use this especially to um, to detect uh, phase transitions in psychotherapy. Um, so the idea is, and you'll see this. Uh, this picture probably again, yes, here we go. <laughs> the idea is uh, when someone is going through uh, psychotherapy, this means they are in a, currently in a state that they do not want to be in, that there is an intervention or somebody is doing something that hopefully will uh, transition them into a state that is a little bit more pleasant. Um, and, uh, and, and we have these ideas about yeah, what 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 goes on during uh, such a process, All right? So, <clears throat> so just to repeat again, if you have like the traditional approach where you would uh, test for the uh, efficiency of the intervention, uh, right? You would you would do this and then measure here one time, measure here one time, and then look at the difference. And then you, yeah, if it works, you are happy. <laughs> uh, but what we are interested in is what's going on here. And if we can, we can learn something about the processes that are going on, uh, really looking at the change, right? Not just establishing that there is change. So that would be like a pre-post design, but we are we are trying to include everything here in between as well. Um, <coughs> usually, that means that that you're looking at case studies. Uh, so uh, that has always been a kind of a you know a critique. Uh, uh, by let's say the mainstream uh, behavioral science or the mainstream uh, clinical psychology. Um, so what we have also been doing is thinking about how can we actually uh, um, yeah, include more patients and be more, a little bit more more general and more certain that we that we're actually onto something that you might find in uh, in not just one or two patients but in uh, a lot of them. Um, and so that requires a little bit of a combination between. The new approach and 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 uh, yeah, statistical inference and generalization. So, well, first of all, we can go through this a little bit more quickly, I think, because we we've, we've talked about this uh, uh, several times already. Um, um, and this is but it is a little bit it is, it is interesting to sort of <coughs> um, know that a lot of the things that are mentioned here, a lot of the the, the literature, they are not necessarily describing uh, the, the, the phenomena that they, that they think are interesting in terms of complexity science, right? They are just noticing, listen, if, you, yeah, if you're dealing with mood disorders and you're, you're looking at what happens when they, when they go into the intervention, very often we, we see these periods of instability uh, popping up. And this is, this is pretty well known in, in, in the literature without making any reference specifically to, uh, to, to, do, to that being like a phase transition or something. Um, and, and you can see here, uh, it has been described in, uh, in several patient groups. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, our own work there. Um, and uh, from, ranging from anxiety in adults with kids, mood disorders, uh, all kinds of different uh, Psychopathologies appear to, to share this, this feature that they indeed um, uh, go through uh, a period of uh, destabilization. And so, yeah, lots of these studies have small sample sizes. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and if you're looking at studies that especially uh, uh, are looking at the pre-post, and then they are just, uh, of course, just mentioning that there might be something like this, but they don't really actually measure it. So, so one of the first uh, studies that we did, did to sort of address at least these concerns about, um, about maybe about sample size and establishing the fact that there is indeed a more more general <coughs> uh, claim to be made about these uh, destabilization periods. Um, uh, this was this study. So it's, it's also very recent. Um, and, um, and here we look specifically um, um, to, 
uh, to uh, to figure out whether the the, uh, the the fact that some somebody had a, a period of destabilization um, um, actually means something for the uh, benefit they might have from the intervention. So we had uh, a data set of 328 patients with mood disorders, um, and and the data we are looking at are uh, multivariate time series data, so questionnaires that uh, that these patients filled in while they were in a uh, in an institute in a clinic uh, over a number of years. And this uh, this system is called the synergetic navigation system. Um, it's not very well known because it's mainly used by just a number of clinics in Austria and Germany. Um, so it has a, it has a, it has a questionnaire which has been validated and all those kind of standard psychometric stuff has been done on this, uh, which has a number of factors. It's called the therapy process questionnaire. And it, it, it asks questions, so it's meant to be asked on a daily basis about, yeah, where, where are we in the therapy? Uh, do you think you're, you're improving? Uh, what about the problem intensity relationship with the uh, 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 quality and trust of the relationship with the therapist? And uh, all kinds of different things that, that are, uh, um, uh, might occur during um, prolonged uh, stay in a clinic and, uh, and intervention. Uh, and also interesting uh, relationship with fellow patients. So it's, it's not just uh, asking about the person itself, it's ask, asking about relationships. How do you feel? How do you, what, what do you think about the future? Those kinds of things. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, it's collected in a real world psychiatric care setting. So these are uh, not, this is not an experiment, but this is just people who uh, go into this, uh, into these clinics, say, they, are told that, they, that this is part of their treatment. Um, and um, so this looks something like this. This is actually a screenshot from what the therapists will see in, in these clinics. So they have access to these, to these uh, data. And, um, and uh, they will use this also to discuss with their patients how they're doing. Right? So they, yeah, these are the dates here. And this, these are just the time series that they generated. And uh, so this is the atmosphere. At home, vertrouwen zu den therapeuten, so trust to the therapist, and well, all these questions, and, 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 and this can be used also by therapists to discuss uh, what's going on. And you can see that some people really spend some time in these clinics, so these are pretty severe um, cases uh, very often. Um, yeah, so that's, that's, this is the synergetic navigation system. Uh, that we used. Yeah, so <laughs> I think we did, I didn't explicitly discuss this um, in the previous uh, days, but it is of course uh, maybe interesting to ask why would you want to have daily self ratings? Um, uh, it's not just because we can, right? So <laughs> we really want to uh, really believe that that is very important. Um, well, one of the things you could do is, is say, well, wh wh what would happen if you do not do this, right? So what you see here is, uh, so this would be like, uh, I think, uh, yeah, this would be, I think, a daily measurement uh, of some kind of variable. Um, and, and let's suppose for a moment that this is really the right sampling frequency, right? So this is also always something that you need to figure out. So how often do I need to ask someone about how do they feel? No, maybe one or two times a day, but if you do this like 100 times a day, that's probably not very helpful. <laughs> um, so, so let's assume that this is, this is you know, very close to the actual fluctuation of this uh, variable that you're interested in. So then, <clears throat> if you would look at B, uh, there you're skipping some days, right? Uh, so only if you only assess every second day. Um, yeah, especially here. Uh, in this period here, you're missing some pretty he heavy uh, fluctuations, right? Um, and, and you might think that it's actually kind of okay, there's a nice baseline here maybe, and then this goes a little bit, well, there are some fluctuations, which you know, that can happen. Um, but it, it, in actual fact, there are many more. And so if you continue to, to, to uh, look at uh, what would happen if you would just 
uh, uh, inc of increase or decrease the, the, the frequency with which you sample, it increase the time that is in between uh, measurement observations. Yeah, you can see that, that, that here you would you wouldn't even have an idea about that there were any fluctuations, right? And, uh, and here it would be gone. And then, and then if you like, would measure every Monday, once a week, here you have, oh my god, it's going, it's going down. Right? And here, no, no, it's going up. If you would have measured every uh, Tuesday, it would be going up. So, yeah, it, it is very important to figure out what the, to get a, get a relatively good estimate about uh, the, 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 the correct uh, frequency, uh, sampling frequency. Um, and, um, yeah, you might get into these kinds of things. And you get, like, this, this would be like an like a enormous jump. Uh, where there would be, well, maybe not, because this is a, a high, high uh, variability uh, period. So uh, and it's not easy to, or to always know what that sampling frequency should be. Um, sometimes it's just uh, experience, uh, and sometimes you'll just have to uh, figure it out, so experimentally uh, test uh, several different uh, uh, sampling frequencies. <coughs> okay, so I think I did not discuss this before, so that's why I put it up here. So then, then another thing <coughs> is, yeah, we're, we're asking people to, to rate their internal states, basically, right? So what we're asking you, how do you feel, and, and project this onto a scale, which is usually very limited. So <coughs> you have visual analog scales that it might go to 100 or to 50. And, um, but very often people just use like one to seven or even one to five. Um, and for a whole bunch of reasons, <coughs> that can be very problematic, especially if you want to do data analysis afterwards. So there is a kind of measurement problem, which I think we discussed over lunch a little bit, um, um, which has to do with the fact that, well, different people will have different ideas about what the scale means and what these values on the scale mean. There are people who never go above or, <laughs> or below the center of the scale, for instance. Right? So their, their maximum value might be three or something like that, and they, they just oscillate between one, two, three. <coughs> so um, it's probably not, not, not a good idea to, to be very um, uh, literal about what these values on the scale mean, especially if you want to, in the case I just described, if you want to compare this to other people. <clears throat> so in that case, what I would do is, is take the maximum value someone has and then, then divide it over everything else so that the maximum value will be one for everyone, for instance. And the, the idea then is that what matters actually is how they differentiate uh, uh, over time, um, <clears throat> the dynamics. So other problems are, right, if you have, so I had to give a talk at, at, uh, at uh, a psychological systems group in Amsterdam by Danny Bosbo, and um, we already had set the date. And then the night before, we ordered some food. Uh, this was on a Monday, and then uh, uh, that night at two o'clock, the whole family was in the bathroom because we had all had food poisoning. <laughs> so I, <coughs> yeah, I couldn't go the next day, and and, uh, and then I uh, I made a rating like you can make these ratings for ordering out. Of course, I won. Come on, man. Uh, you were too late, and, and, and we had all had food poisoning. But the thing is, so this is also a rating scale. I had already given a one at some point, but that was because we got the wrong order, and they were also late, and the food was cold, right? But that one, now, now would, if that would happen again, I would, I would, I would not give a one, right? I would not give a score of one. Because I have a much more severe experience, which was food poisoning. <laughs> And, and everything that I evaluate, uh, 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 every event uh, I, I have with ordering out, I will evaluate relative to this very bad food poisoning thing. So, so these, these scales, <coughs> especially if they are about psychological variables or opinions, they will, they will uh, shift within a person depending on what they experience. Right? So, and for time series, that's a problem. Because if this happens during your measurement, what do these values mean? You don't, you don't know. Uh, 
And you might figure out if you're very detailed and re record everything and ask people to, to, <laughs> to, to report uh, important events or something like that. But, but that's probably not very useful. So <clears throat> what we are, we're looking for are ways to deal with at least uh, some of these concerns. This is one example. And it's called dynamic complexity. And this is a way of calculating, <coughs> um, of dealing with, uh, like, let's say, uh, uh, discrete, especially, that's especially good for dealing with discrete rating scales, right? And if you want to calculate it, you have to do this. Or you can use custom. Uh, but the idea here is that um, if you have a pattern of, um, of sequences of these well, uh, bounded discrete numbers. Um, the, the, the usual statistical uh, measures you would calculate, they really don't distinguish between different patterns of responses. So uh, let me go to, <coughs> you can forget about this. Let me go to this slide to make it a little bit more clear. <coughs> So here you have a response pattern. So these are days, right? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. What happens in, in dynamic complexity, you usually uh, calculate this in a, in a window of a couple, couple of days. So you need at least seven or five. You could also do five. Um, uh, a window of five days to, to calculate this, uh, this measure. So, so here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times this person says uh, three. How do you feel? Oh, three. Three, 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 three. Okay. So the mean here would be, uh, or the median would be three. Uh, variance would be zero, right? No, no, no changes here. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, that's that's uh, that's what your your measurement sort of would 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 have to reflect. So in this case, <coughs> the, if you take the median. If you calculate the standard deviation, you would actually be fine because there, there, the, they would tell you the same thing, right? But here you have a situation uh, uh, where we are oscillating between two and five, <coughs> for instance. And if you would take the median, uh, you get somewhere in between, um, and, and and there would be like a, a little bit of a standard deviation, a little bit of variance. And this, this, the point is that this pattern can be produced by many different other sequences of this oscillation. Right? If you just flip it, for instance, um, uh, you, would, you would get the same statistics out of it. Uh, this case is more extreme. Here you have one, two, three, four times one, three times seven. Here, one, two, three, four times one, three times seven. But if you calculate the uh, uh, the mean and the median for these two patterns, you would get the same result. But these are definitely different, right? So you want a measure that is able to distinguish between this pattern, which is just actually, in terms of fluctuation, it's not, not so much. It's just a jump in, in level, basically, but it's not really highly fluctuating. And this is oscillating, right? So and that's what this dynamic complexity uh, does. The dynamic complexity is able to distinguish between these uh, these things. So if there's no fluctuation, you will get zeros. If there is some fluctuation, th these numbers, these are these are aspects of this. Uh, so this is the variance. And these two things, if you multiply them together, will give you the, the dynamic complexity. Um, and you can see that they can distinguish between patterns of uh, oscillation, whereas the variance cannot. Right. So you have exactly the same thing. Well, here also the variance tells you it's, it's the same thing going on here. But if you look, so these are the same, uh, the same number of numbers. So the, 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 all the, 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 rate, the values of the scale are in there. Here as well, but in a completely different pattern. Right? So this, this is a linear increase, but this is you know, this oscillating uh, expansion. And you want to be able to distinguish between those. And by using the dynamic complexity, you can do this. So it's especially useful for um, working with these uh, rating scales. <coughs> and also the fact that you can have a relatively short, you can calculate it in a relatively short window. 
Um, and the reason for this is we want to be, uh, we want to have tools that we can actually use in practice to predict something, right? So to, we want to predict these changes that are coming. Um, well, and the way to do this is is to, of course, well, the, these patients come into the cl uh, the clinic, right? So they start filling out these uh, these forms. So then, after seven days or after five days, we can get our first estimate of the fluctuations, and the, and then this we, we keep on uh, recording by moving the window one step further and one step further. So you get a time series of this dynamic complexity, uh, which is actually telling us something about how how uh, uh, how the fluctuations basically or the fluctuation intensity was during. Uh, the past seven days. And then if we see this go up, this could be an indication, well, maybe there's something going on here. Okay. Yeah, so these, these are the types of <coughs> time series. I don't know if this is visible, but so this would be like the, today I experienced anxiety, right? So you get the patient gets in, they answer some of these questions, and then after this window is filled, here we start with the dynamic complexity. And this means that, th so this is sort of the average fluctuation intensity of the past week. And this we will try to use to predict um, uh, what is going on. In this case, it's not really very clear. Yeah, maybe there's a drop here, right? So <coughs> um, yeah, okay, so window, and there we start. And then this window slides, of course, right? So. The next data point is just everything shifted one uh, step. And so, so this is kind of important because it, that this, this means that we do not need to wait until the experiment is complete mm -hmm. and then figure out, oh yeah, we could have made, an, <laughs> we could have made a decision here. Now we want, we want tools that, that you can actually use. So as the data comes in, you can calculate this and yeah, uh, make decisions based on it. That's the, uh, that's the point. Yeah, okay. And uh, yeah, you get this, uh, um, these uh, uh, average curves of these uh, uh, complexity values. And what we will be looking for then is, uh, yeah, peaks. Peaks in this in this curve. And for this analysis, uh, we, uh, did it, we started to relatively simple. <laughs> so we were looking for are there any peaks in this complex, uh, dynamic complexity curve? Um, we take into account uh, treatment duration because remember we want to sort of, yeah, uh, 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 carry a little bit of commentary about that uh, that all these studies were done on, on small groups. So now we have a large sample. Uh, so we're adding some uh, factors in there. A very simple <coughs> classical statistical analysis, let's say. Well, classical do with mixed effects, of course. Um, but the setup is sort of is sort of something that, that people who are only working with pre post designs could understand, right? The only difference is what we what we've done is we have analyzed all the time series and have tried to figure out, you know, whether there are any peaks in these uh, <coughs> in these time series. So well what do we find? Um, uh, if you look at this pre-post uh, uh, evaluation of, of uh, symptom severity, it turns out that those, the, those people with the highest uh, peak complexity, so this is actually talking about actually the, the value of this dynamic complexity curve, they experience the, the largest decrease in uh, symptom severity, right? And this, and, and a medium, and then the low, uh, low peaks. Um, those people did not uh, uh, experience a, uh, a, a drop that is as great as uh, the other ones. And um, it's actually actually a little, uh, uh, a little bit of a nonlinear relationship there in terms of, so here you have the, the value of the dynamic complexi complexity, and this is a different score of the pre and post in terms of severity. Okay, so that was kind of uh, <laughs> to get some people on board who might not yet be on board <laughs> um, um, and convince them that it's very interesting to start looking at the process and process measures. Um, but also, 
my PhD student was just, this was his master's thesis, so he didn't know about all, <laughs> all the more complicated techniques. Uh, but it was good enough to, uh, to make a good point, I think. So patients with higher peak complexity have stronger reduction in problem intensity. Uh, destabilization periods, as indicated, of course, by the, by the complexity. Um, uh, that may be uh, beneficial. Yeah, so oh yeah, this was one of the points that, that, that people thought that there was a whole school of, of thought in, in, uh, in clinical psychology who thought that you should actually avoid those destabilizations because they might be harming the progress of the patient. <laughs> and this is kind of saying, well, maybe it's actually beneficial. Maybe you have to go through uh, this destabilization and uh, um, uh, in order for, yeah, to get to a different state, basically. Um, yeah, so, so what this did not yet answer the question of um, um, can we actually use this now for uh, uh, short-term prediction, right? So this was just comparing pre-post, and, and this was actually what I described, so uh, uh, doing it the classical way. Um, so and this, this is what it, what, where this other study comes in, and I've, I've talked about this already. So, um, but this was actually to show that it is possible to do this real-time prediction. Um, so, <coughs> again, I already showed you this. Uh, this would be this uh, synergetic navigation system, right? By one patient, fill out over 60 days all these uh, questionnaires about how the process is going. Um, then we had, uh, uh, <coughs> yeah, we decided, yeah, you have to have some kind of criteria which, with which you can use to, to decide whether people are, well, something is changing, right? So we're, we're looking at sudden gains and losses. Um, the way we uh, analyze this, so this, this horizontal lines that are, and these drops that are in there, that's actually an, uh, an analysis. Uh, that is also in, uh, in Cosnet. Um, it goes a little bit too far maybe to explain it, but it's, uh, what it is doing is it's, it's trying to find levels of the data based on um, classification and regression trees. But um, it's, uh, it's pretty uh, consistent, pretty reliable technique. And in this case, we have a patient who has who experiences, uh, yeah, you could say here we, we get a little bit of an increase, right? Because the level is going up. But we have some, some uh, a number of criteria uh, for deciding whether it's actually really a gain or just a small change. So this change was too small for us to consider it a, a gain or a loss. Uh, so, but this uh, this uh, patient here has two drops in the symptom severity, um, and uh, yeah. and the idea is then to, from this time series, calculate the dynamic complexity. So there are a number of ways to approach this. You you could you can calculate them. Uh, you can calculate dynamic complexity curves for each variable, and then focus on a number of variables or you could average it. We decided here to average it, it's not, not really my, my thing, but well, that's what we did. Um, uh, but uh, there are other ways to, to deal with this. For instance, um, uh, you could have some kind of criterion where you would uh, say, well, if, if we have like peaks in three or four uh, of these time series, then that's, that's, those are the time series that we will use for this period to, to do the prediction. But that was a little bit too uh, too complicated. You might have to write first write a, a methods paper about how that would work. But what we what you get here then is a is a is a kind of mean dynamic complexity peak based on these things. And what you see here is is indeed so before the, this drop, you see here a peak in dynamic complexity, which means there's a in the previous periods here there has been an, uh, a, a, a peak in the uh, fluctuation intensity. And um, well, here you might say this is my, might be a little bit too far out. Um, and in fact, we, we ended up with using a prediction window of four days. So it might actually be that this would not count in our uh, analysis as, uh, as a peak for this uh, drop. Um, 
so, so sorry. Uh, do you remember, Fred, uh, about the gains and losses, which were the, the were there some like universal occurrences that the same thing caused this peak or or, or, or the loss, like payday uh, or meeting a loved one or what? Yeah. yeah. Well, we would really very much like to know those things. Mm -hmm. So we are now looking for um, because. What I already told you is, is, so one of the results here is that we can only predict that the change is coming, but not with which direction it is, right? And so what we really would like to know is have these qualitative information about patients that, that might give us insight into, uh, into also the direction. So maybe if we include that in our predictions, then we might be able to say, well, there's a lot of fluctuation going on. But, oh, you know, he's in love or she's in love, so it might be, be okay. Uh, but the other thing could be uh, just lost a job or something like that. And then we, we, would be, yeah, we, we really want to include those things, but we don't have it right now. But that's really part of uh, what we're going to do. Um, oh, yeah, and then the way we did this uh, was um, uh, multi-level survival anal analysis or multi-level event occurrence analysis, which means that you have, uh, uh, let's say, the, ev the events that we want to uh, uh, predict are uh, uh, the, the gains or the losses, right? So you have, uh, for this patient, for instance, you would have a time series, which has lots of zeros here, and then uh, here a one, and there a one, and then you can uh, feed in the, uh, the uh, complexity curve um, or features of the complexity curve um, uh, to serve as a predictor for these events. So it's, it's, it is a statistical model, right? But it is, uh, well, let's say within the limits of what is possible currently, uh, probably maximally taking into account uh, individual variation in, uh, in these patients, uh, individual variation over time. So what was the result? I already talked about this. So if you have a one standard deviation increase in dynamic complexity, in the next four days, you'll have a 55% chance that a gain or a loss will occur. Right, an increased chance, right? Not 55%, but the, the risk of get, getting a, uh, uh, a gain or loss is, uh, is increased. So yeah, this, so, so this really could be an early warning signal, right? It could be uh, something to look at, which could actually be used in practice uh, by therapists to, uh, yeah, to, to get a grip on uh, what's going on with their patient. Um, yeah, okay, this is just stating what, that we, we think that, that these shifts actually represent something like what happens in physical systems when you, when you go through a phase transition. And um, um, yeah, the, the idea is to use this eventually in, uh, in uh, patients in, in real time. And <clears throat> so a lot of our research is, is, uh, is about this and about answering more and more questions about this. One of them indeed is, yeah, we want to be able to think about whether we can predict the direction of the, of the change, because that's, that's one of the things which makes sense, right? Because you know, entropy or fluctuation or slowing down, those kinds of things, they don't care about what, what it is that, that you're analyzing here. Um, uh, they just uh, tell you something is going to change. Um, so here's an example, <coughs> uh, which I also showed you. Yeah, on Monday, uh, this is a this is a, a, a master's thesis a case study of um, youth with uh, intellectual disability, and uh, well, what happens very often is that these kids they uh, yeah they go into substance abuse, although this is not maybe not really a very severe case, but this uh, this uh, person uh, wanted to get wanted to stop smoking uh, marijuana. So what you see here is the number of joints uh, smoked each day, self-reported. Um, there was a baseline, and then there was an uh, intervention uh, period. 
and um, uh, the the uh, the patient the, the, uh, filled out each day uh, a list of uh, questions. That's what you see here. And this color coding is just uh, is, is, these were all rating scales. So this is just telling you whether they answered with a one or with a seven or somewhere in between. Um, and uh, there were like uh, yeah, very common uh, uh, questions in there that are commonly asked, like happy, craving, right? How much do you crave? Smoking. Are you bored? Are you upset? Are you sad? And they also could uh, come up with one or two questions that, that they thought were important for them. That they could, so uh, this takes some, some work because we are talking about pretty severe intellectual disability. So not, not so much that you cannot uh, uh, function anymore, but they cannot live on their own, basically. So they're living in a, in a group. Um, and this uh, person came up with uh, the variable error, <laughs> which means, yeah, sometimes I feel error in my head, and um, and when that's when I have that, then then, then things go wrong. <laughs> so okay, we said we'll ask this every day. How how, how are you doing on the error in your head? Um, and actually, it turned out that this was well, not not even the impor most important one, but it was. Uh, it it also gives. Uh, of course, the patients are feeling that they are much more involved in their in their process. Right? So it's not just laid down because much of their lives is already very much controlled by other people. And uh, yeah, the idea of uh, of uh, so being involved in their own uh, process is uh, is very positive. <coughs> At least they experience it. It's very positive. So what you see here then, this is what we would call a complexity resonance diagram. Um, and this is indicating uh, what the value of the dynamic complexity is. So first we wait seven days, right? And then this, re this here represents the complexity, the fluctuation intensity of the questions that, uh, uh, yeah, in the past seven days. And then we shift this window and then we go. So, the, so here you, you below you see again the number of joints smoked. And then here, this gray line is the mean mean of this uh, dynamic complexity. So after some point uh, during the intervention, uh, the patient said, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit completely. And interestingly, so that's this point here. Yeah. Uh, and and you, it, this is the dynamic complexity. So, And you have to remember, this is about what happened seven days before. Right? So we, had, we really have a peak here in the the intensity uh, fluctuations uh, over time, uh, which seems to indicate that he was now ready for. Uh, and, and interestingly, before this period, um, uh, according to the, the, to the therapist, uh, uh, he did not mention anything about willingness to stop or something like that. So this was quite sudden. He said, now I'm going to stop tomorrow, I'm not going to smoke again. Well, we have this gray area here. <laughs> Because what happened? Oh, he succeeded. Oh, well, one joint. But then there, there was a, like a fallback, and then again, and then again, and then you can see that this this dynamic complexity here starts to rise a bit again. <laughs> you see? And then we have this gray area. Uh, he didn't want to uh, participate anymore with uh, experiments. Uh, turned out a lot of it was shame that he could not could not uh, keep up. But then after, I, this is almost two weeks, I think, uh, <coughs> started again uh, filling out the, the things. Yeah, if they don't fill out, we don't have data. And then here you see after seven days, this uh, dynamic complexity starts again, and I think they continued it. He's still smoking something somewhat, but less than before. <laughs> okay, but this is just a case study of how this could work in practice, right? So this is actually, it's being used, so uh, being discussed, and uh, we have some, apparently, some predictive value here also of looking at this uh, fluctuation intensity. Uh, and yeah, and so we have many of these kinds of uh, relatively simple studies going on with, with which students actually can do. And then, uh, you know, all the larger stuff is, uh, is then what we uh, are concerned with with our PhDs and postdocs. Okay, so yeah, this is the multivariate analysis 
of, uh, of complexity uh, with actual applications. Any questions about this? So you can do these things in Cosnet. Um, you can produce these uh, diagrams also in Cosnet. Um, number of functions uh, uh, included, and uh, maybe if you don't have any questions, or you do. Yeah. Uh, has there been any work yet about uh, how to distinguish these uh, periods of instability that lead to clinical improvement from those who are just like like plain chaotic? Uh, I would imagine there ha there could be these like like chaotic attractors that are harmful in some uh, mental disorders. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess it would be hard to distinguish them from these, which lead to improvement. Yeah, well, so if you, if you think about the result here, it's, it's uh, you have an increased risk of 55%, not 100%, right? So there are fluctuations and there are peaks in this dynamic complexity that do not lead to a shift. So but what you're asking is, if you, if you know that people have had a positive shift, uh, or are you not asking that? <laughs> How do you know that that's a real transition or that's just random chaos? Or was that uh, I'm, I'm just very naively asking, oh, okay. uh, can, can we distinguish? Well, no, that, that is really, so, so that, that's really an open question. That's actually what we're trying to, to uh, find out uh, uh, right now. Uh, that's one of the projects that we're interested in. Um, but uh, so if you remember yesterday I showed you a um, very briefly a, uh, uh, a graph of the RQA measures and the parameters of the logistic map so, so that it sort of, sort of the RQA could distinguish between <coughs> different parameter settings where it would go in and out of chaos and chaos, chaos transitions, and those kinds of things. So I think that would actually be required if you want to do that and, and distinguish between those uh, those different types of transitions, because yeah, there are the, there are different classifications for these transitions. So for instance, I talked about the shift in the gaining of insight. That's kind of a different transition than boiling water, right? Because once you've gained insight, it's very unlikely that you will ever return to not having insight unless something very catastrophic happens and you have to lose your memory or something like that. But water can go back and forth to ice, you know, infinitely. Doesn't doesn't. So that's that's what's a little bit different about those kinds of transitions, which are clearly qualitatively different states. But yeah, you tend not to go back, and sometimes there aren't really very clear examples from physics. That, that do the same thing. Uh, so, so that's where I think, at least theoretically, we should, we should do our own <laughs> development about describing what these things look like, because this, this plays a role in, if you want to describe developmental phases, phases in learning, all those kinds of things are typically not things that non-living physical systems do. <laughs> uh, so there's lots of work there. Yeah. But it's, I think that's important to know. So if you can use RQA to look at these transitions, um, why is why uh, prefer dynamic complexity to uh, and well, instead of doing actually RQA? in the in the synergetic navigation yeah. system, you, they also uh, use uh, RQA. So they also use, use recurrence plots. Um, yeah, I don't know. I think this is. Um, it is, it is the case that for RQA, you need to wait a little longer before you get, can do, make the plot. So the dynamic complexity will give you after seven days or five days even. And I think RQA, yeah, would, you need like 20 data points. So it is, it is a little bit more, uh, but, in, uh, but in, the, in this uh, system, also in these clinics, they, they also will at some point start to output uh, recurrence plots yeah, and update them. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there are publications about uh, this uh, system also uh, by uh, Gunther Schiepek, so you could look them up and then they show basically all the stuff that, uh, that they uh, get out of it, because they also calculate entropy measures and those kinds of things. So maybe I can quickly show you uh, the 
how this is sort of implemented in uh, CASNet. Yeah. So this is uh, this is one of the vignettes of the R package, um, and uh, you can get to it through the uh, through the website. Um, so yeah, this also includes some comments on how you would deal with uh, missing values, which is always a problem. Of course, you, you will get people who will forget to answer or um, you know just don't, and uh, of course you want to know whether there is some systematicity in there, so is it the case that, uh, that they want, don't want to report you something or something like that. But that's, that's not very different from you know, general research, of course, if you have lots of uh, variables to measure, this will just happen. Uh, so in the beginning of this vignette, there are some comments on, <coughs> and also links to packages you could use um, to uh, deal with those things. Uh, but there is also a whole separate uh, vignette about this, so there's uh, a whole uh, thing about how you should deal with those things. Uh, but there are a number of uh, packages that are pretty, <coughs> pretty good. Uh, so I will skip that for now, <laughs> and you trust me that we we've done <coughs> basically always the the and the advice is of course if you have missing values and you want to replace them with some other value by using a model or you know a mean or something like that. Always report both, right? Always report the data without the missing values and with the imputation. And then uh, report what's different between those things. That's, that's the best uh, thing you can do, uh, basically. Um, so here we go through some of those uh, things. OK. Um, yeah. So this is a data set uh, that has been used in a paper. I don't know if this is published yet, but there is a preprint uh, in which they had like one of this uh, EMA data set by a patient, and they had <coughs> many analysts look at, uh, analyze this uh, uh, this data set, <coughs> and um, and then yeah, give recommendations. So if you were a, uh, a therapist, what would you recommend? Uh, but they didn't ask us to do this. But uh, you get people that, uh, yeah, that they use uh, statistical models and, and, and uh, network models and those kinds of things. And I think they ask like ten different, ten different people. And of course, you get ten different recommendations for the patient. Uh, but so that's so that's really an interesting uh, paper to look at. But um, so now we're using this in the vignette. Um, and and one of the. Uh, uh, one of the variables in there is, I think, uh, has to do with the um, hours of sleep this patient was getting, or the quality of the sleep. And uh, here you see this uh, procedure for detecting these uh, different levels in the time series, uh, which is called um, actually recursive partitioning. Uh, but uh, uh, <coughs> the command is very simple, it's just TS levels, and you just enter in your variable and it will search for uh, these uh, uh, different uh, uh, levels in the data, depending also on the, on the parameters you uh, feed it. Um, yes, so you, how do you choose the <coughs> sensitivity or the parameters? How do you choose them? Yeah. Well, um, by uh, looking at <laughs> What it gives you? <laughs> yeah, there's. I cannot give you a. Uh, uh, so you can have like a theoretical um, idea about it. So, for instance, if I have, uh, when do I call a level a level? Mm -hmm. So does it have? Can it last one day? Is that a level, or does it have to last three days, or maybe seven days? Those kinds of things I cannot answer in advance. I don't know what you're studying. So uh, I would say um, uh, for mood, mood shifts, uh, I think we have like four days at least. So if you're, that, that's, really then a left, that's really then a state that is continuously in a particular uh, yeah, state for, good, uh, for a, a particular amount of time. Uh, uh, and and other, ver other, other things you can put in uh, have different, different effects. So 
can there be a light shift or, or, or how, how far does the level have to shift up or down? When do you call this a new level? Those are ba basically all kinds of... Uh, I think that they are best, uh, best um, set by thinking about what it is you observe and what you, what you consider a level or not. But we have done comparisons with like automatic level detection things, like uh, the change point detection, those kinds of things, and they um, they are generally uh, less conservative than our. <laughs> yeah. So and and mostly they give the, sh the same type of results, but um, yeah. So that's uh, that's something you have to. Um, Think about and then also, of course, very precisely report what your decisions were and those kind of things. Yeah. But there are also ways to do this automatically. But I I don't understand exactly what they do, so that's why I, if I can't understand it, I won't use it. <laughs> and so then, uh, if you have a multivariate um, um, data set, uh, you can very easily create these. Uh, types of uh, plots. So here we have uh, questions, right? And here we have um, these uh, are the dynamic complexity values. And then you have, so yeah, you have some s sorting uh, options. So for instance, this is sorted by variable name. But you could also order them by mean uh, dynamic uh, complexity. So, so the, the variables with the highest dynamic complexity are at the top here. And this uh, facilitates a little bit identifying regions of, uh, of instability. Right? So, so this would be probably uh, an instable region, maybe here as well. Um, but uh, you could do more than just eyeballing. Um, oh, this is a different. So this is. Uh, used to be called differently, but today, nowadays, we call it the cumulative, cumulative complexity peak plot. Um, so this the top row here is just indicating whether there are uh, enough time series that have a, a peak in the data at that time point. Right? So here, and it, it, this is kind of a very simple criterion with uh, the set score above something. Um, uh, but this indicating like like the more black dots you have there, this that that, that could be an indication uh, that there's really a, a period of destabilization going on there, which is called then uh, critical instability. Um, okay, so that's all in the in the Cosnet uh, paper. Yeah, we present here uh, the missing values removed and then the imputed missing values. And you can see that actually for the detection of the location of the instable period, it, it's not really very different. So we have at least, yeah, maybe this one is missing here, right? Yeah. So here, so this might be caused by the, uh, by the imputation. Uh, we're not really sure. But these, these look very reliably, like, like actual critical uh, um, periods. So how can you tell? Hmm? Well, okay, so this, this plot here is based on the time series where the missing values have been removed, just removed from the data. This one, or I said to uh, missing, right? This one uh, is imputed. So there we replaced the missing values using a particular replacement routine. So if you look at the difference between those, we see this we get, this we get, but here at the end we only get this for the imputed. So I'm not sure whether that's a real one or that's an artifact of our imputation method. Hmm. So but these are consistent. Yeah. How did you get to that mean? Oh, uh, if you are here, sorry, sorry, oh, oh it's here. <laughs> This is the, the website for the course, right? Yes. And here you have our package, Casnet. Oh. And then under Articles, Applied Synergetics, and then there you go. 
Yeah, so this article was called Time to get personal, the impact of researchers' choices on the selection of treatment targets using experience sampling methodology. So it's on, uh, on the psych archive, I think, yeah. Yeah. So pretty uh, impressive group of people here. Uh, Evelyn Snip, uh, Zucker, Marike Wiegers, Slava Brinman, Aiden Wright. Um, where is Fisher? Yeah, Aaron Fisher, Alan Haarmaker. <laughs> uh, not us, but uh, anyway. <laughs> but they, yeah, so I think they have a. Here we go. So this is interesting to look at because. Oh, 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 oh. So I've told you about a whole bunch of techniques that deal with complex, you know, that deal with uh, based on complexity science. So and now this this is a list of the techniques that were used to analyze these data that that, that I've just shown you basically. So this 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 data set was analyzed by these people who are uh, well experts also in in uh, these these type of time series analysis. But if you look at the techniques. I've, I haven't talked about any of those, <laughs> right? So none, none of these people are using really any techniques that are based on, um, on uh, complexity science. These are all uh, statistical models. So they use a lot of principal components or exploratory factor analysis. Uh, and there's, there's, uh, I think this was, this was a clustering, this was how to get the important time series or something, but there's also uh, a time series table somewhere, I think. Or is this, yeah, this might be. Clustering and target selection for each team. So they, they, they these are the, there were 12 teams and these are the, uh, variables that they could select, and then the differences and the, the difference in the methods that they, that were used. But anyway, none of them use any of the techniques that I've been talking about. But if you look at uh, introductions of the papers they write, they are saying we're dealing with a complex system, and we should do uh, uh, time series analysis and do, do complex stuff. But but when you look at what they actually do, then. Um, yeah, that's not that's not complex. It just it's not it's just they, they, they use statistical models, and um, yeah, I think that's a little bit problematic sometimes. Why? Well, because <coughs> you can. I, I think you need to use the right methods for the job, right? So if you really believe that that you're dealing with a complex system, this means you are dealing with uh, systems that m might be non-stationary that might experience these differences in, in the way they fluctuate with these periods of destabilization. So they're, they're, they're not homogeneous in terms of the, of the, of the variance. Um, and all these methods that, are, that were, were up there, except maybe for one, <laughs> they all assume that this, the stuff that they're, they're looking at is stationary and homogeneous. So that's, I think that's a statistical argument, but that, of course, theoretically, you know, there is a whole discipline, I've, I've shown you this, <laughs> that is actually uh, 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 saying well, that, well, then we have to use stuff from complexity science. And it's not the case that, that for instance, what I'm, the data that I showed you are from Gunther Schiepek from Austria. He's been doing this since the 90s, together with Hermann Haken, who's a mathematician, who uh, basically developed a lot of these uh, things. So uh, to, at home, I have like a book like this, which is called Synergetics in Psychotherapy, uh, but it's all in German. <laughs> but it, it's it's very technical, and it explains all the mathematical foundations for looking at this, looking at phase transitions, looking at uh, potential landscapes, all those kinds of things. And it's uh, th that's also a book from the 90s, mm. or early 2000s. Okay, so maybe we can.
get some of Mati's nice coffee. <laughs> and then I can tell you something about um, networks.